So we're covering chapter 17. We've, co uh, we've covered quite a few topics. Um, uh, chapter 17.1 was about Latin America. 17.2 was about Africa. 17.3, what was that one about? Anyone remember? Oh, that was Gandhi, that was mine, sorry. <laughs> 17.4, what was that one about? I can't even remember. That was about China and Japan. And now we're on 17.5. So this is talking about the West after World War I, all the different cultural changes that are going on, all the different political changes that are going on. So what's interesting and kind of fun about this, um, this chapter is that we're jumping around all over the place. And that's actually one of the reasons where I really like this chapter because we get a snapshot of what's going on everywhere else. So let's get going. Learning objectives. Analyze how Western society and culture changed after World War I. We're gonna identify contributions of modern scientists like Marie Curie and Albert Einstein. I almost said Albert, but it's Albert. Summarize the domestic and foreign policy issues that the Western democracies faced after the war. We're gonna describe how global depression began and spread. We're gonna explain responses of Britain, France, and the United States to the Great Depression. Lots going on in this section. Um, lots and lots of stuff happening. So let's get going, shall we? So World War I obviously was a huge deal. <laughs> I mean, something like 16 million people died, killed. Um, entire societies just devastated. Entire government structures rocked to their core. We saw the, uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917. They toppled the Tsar. Um, but then the question is, you know what? What next? <laughs> I always wonder that. What do you do the next day after something terrible like this comes to an end? And that's where we're going to get going. Um, another thing that's really important to point out is that there was there was a lot of optimism about the future before World War I. Um, people were very, very excited of what the 20th century will hold for them. Um, you see that with a lot of science fiction, for instance, H.G. Wells. Um, there was also a book written that said that because of global trade, that war will be impossible, that there won't be any more war. And that ended up not being true whatsoever. And so there was a lot of optimism before World War I and after World War I, there's a lot of skepticism there's a lot of almost nihilism in some ways, but we'll discuss that in a moment. So, 1920s, the roaring 20s, it, well, at least for the United States. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the economy uh, as people are demobilizing. There's an economic boom throughout the 1920s, especially in the United States. Um, decade in the West is often called the Jazz Age. African-American musicians combined Western harmonies with African rhythms to create jazz. Jazz musicians like trumpeter Louis Armstrong and pianist Duke Ellington took simple melodies and improvised endless subtle variations in rhythm and beat. Anyone see the B movie? <laughs> you like jazz? There's also a lot of changes going on in the roles of women, both socially and politically. Um, in the United States, the, what was it, the 19th Amendment, I believe, um, women get the right to vote in the United States. They also get the right to vote in, um, in Britain. But that being said, the very first place to offer women the right to vote was Wyoming. Congratulations, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. um, this woman here on the top. She is named Miriam Ferguson. 
she was the, uh, the Texas governor. So I think she was the first woman elected to be the governor of Texas. We also see the advent of the flapper. Um, new type of liberated young woman, woman called the flapper. The first flappers were American, but their European sisters soon adopted the fashion. Flappers rejected old ways in favor of new exciting freedoms. So women are going out and expressing themselves and not, and really challenging kind of more traditional roles. But there's a lot of different reactions to this, this boom time, this roaring 20s, this jazz age. There are many people that are fully embracing it, like the flappers, for instance. And there are others who are saying, ah, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe we should be a bit more traditional. Maybe we should be a bit more conservative. Um, so there are these differing reactions. And we can also see that with uh, prohibition. So in the United States throughout the 1920s, alcohol was illegal. You cannot buy it legally. So what do people end up doing? Making it on their own. Making it on their own, going to speakeasies. Um, organized crime gets involved, Al Capone, um, lots of different bootleggers. And what's interesting about it is that because alcohol is banned, people that normally wouldn't break the law now find themselves breaking the law. Um, and so, you know, the, the feds, they go around and they, they break up the speakeasies. They, they are pouring barrels of alcohol down the sewer. Um, they're just destroying bottles and bottles of alcohol. And in one, in one rather extreme instance, um, so the bootleggers, you know, they're trying to make their own alcohol. And what ends up happening is it, it's very similar to the drug trade in many ways. Um, they end up making alcohol that is actually stronger than, than it normally would be. Um, the idea being that since it's illegal <laughs> and you have to uh, evade the cops in order to sell it, um, you want to sell it in as small of a quantity as you can, but with the biggest hit that you can. So you end up with very, very hard alcohols, almost sometimes poisonous alcohols that are being sold. Um, sometimes the bootleggers, so there were, there were exceptions to the alcohol ban. Um, so for instance, there are industrial uses of alcohol that businesses might use. And I'm talking about like 100% pure alcohol. And should you ever drink that, by the way, 100% pure alcohol? No. No, you will die. Do not do that. Um, so what the bootleg, some bootleggers were doing was they were actually robbing these places that had industrial grade alcohol. They were stealing alcohol from, from these businesses and these industries and then filtering it out, uh, diluting it more so that way it wasn't just poison. So they were doing that and then the feds said, okay, well, if they're gonna do that, then they actually poisoned the industrial alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making that up. That's true. <laughs> the federal government po put poison in industrial alcohol and several thousand people died because of that. Um, naturally, of course, though, lots of people were not in favor of this. And we can see this very interesting protest sign. <laughs> very strange protest sign. Um, we want beer. And eventually, so throughout the 20s, alcohol was illegal. And then when FDR becomes president, uh, they reverse that decision and alcohol becomes legal once again. Um, I can't remember his name, uh, but there was an FBI agent who was very famous during this time period. And he was a key leader in breaking up the speakeasies and pouring alcohol down the sewers. And I can't remember his name. Uh, shoot, but he was asked once once prohibition ended and alcohol was legal again, 
he's asked, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to go get a drink, <laughs> which I just find so funny and ironic. <laughs> and why are you enforcing this all this time? <laughs> OK, anyway, moving on. Any questions on this? All right, moving on. Radio. Radio is an early example of mass media linking people over long distances here. A woman is using the radio to keep in touch with events to the outside world. And just <laughs> imagine that though, look how bulky this is. And she's just sitting there listening. Meanwhile, you know, I've got wireless headphones. I can, <laughs> I can sit in my bed. My iPod is like this big, it's a bit small. And it's amazing just how technology has changed so quickly. This is only 80 years ago. No, sorry, this is only 100 years ago. Wow, oh my gosh, the 20s. We're in the 20s now, isn't that crazy? Where we are, oh my God. I know, it's 2021, <laughs> space. You're right, I know, I just, I, I just realized that, wait, what? <laughs> Do we have to rename this to like the 1920s because that I don't like I mean, confuse this with the 20s? I mean, we'll have to. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Eventually, ah, crazy. All right, scientific discoveries. So all sorts of different scientific discoveries are being made during this time period. And many of them are challenging long held ideas about the nature of the world and the nature of people. And as a result, there is a, a widespread sense of uncertainty. So for instance, we have Marie Curie. She was a chemist and she actually won the Nobel prize in science. Um, and she did all sorts of experiments on radioactivity. And I believe she actually discovered radioactivity. Um, unfortunately, because, I mean, she discovered it. And so we didn't really understand all the, all the aspects of it. And so she's doing these experiments with like <laughs> very dangerous chemicals. And she ended up getting radiation poisoning and sickness. And I believe she died from cancer because of all of these radioactive experiments that she was doing. So really sad and really tragic, but amazing that she was able to do all of these things. And also we should really emphasize that she is a woman. And um, you know, this was a time period when women were not expected to be doing these kind of things. They were expected to be homemakers and, and let, them, let the men, let the men do it. And so she is very much a groundbreaking person in many, many ways, not only because she discovered radioactivity, but also because she's a woman doing these things and winning the Nobel Prize. We also have Einstein, Albert Einstein. He worked as a clerk in a patent office in Switzerland, if I remember correctly, um, when he came up with this wonderful idea of the theory of relativity. And essentially what this is, is that time and space are very much interlinked with one another. And that you can have distortions in time if you have enough uh, matter concentrated into one thing. That's why we, we observe something called the dilation, time dilation, for instance. Um, anyone see that movie Interstellar? No, how dare you? It's a wonderful movie, Christopher Nolan. I don't really care for the ending too much, or at least the twist. Like love is a force in the universe. I, eh, I didn't care for that very much, but the book, the movie as a whole is really, really good. Um, and we can also see this, that not only is it, we can see here in this, in this image, um, my apologies, um, that so there's a white dwarf sitting in space and it's actually distorting the light around it. And so light is bending around it. The other interesting part of this is um, the faster you go, the slower time goes. And that's actually proven. <laughs> so they, they took two atomic clocks and they were set at the exact same time. And they left one clock on earth and they put the other one in the International Space Station. 
And the, and the International Space Station is zipping around the Earth like 17 times a day. It's moving very, very quickly. Um, and they found when they brought the clock from the space station down, that there was like a second difference between the two. And so there was a time dilation, even though these were both uh, atomic clocks that were set to the exact same time when they were separated. Um, so this has been a proven thing. Mr. Jamison. Uh, yeah. Uh, they also did this with the world's tallest tower, the Tokyo Sky Tree, where they put oh, a really? clock at the base and then a clock on top. And there was a difference? Yeah, there was a difference because the oh. higher elevation, the um, I mean, the further away that you are, I mean, the less you know, gravity there is. So the, so there was like a very, very, very slight difference. Huh, that's crazy. I didn't know that. We also have Alexander Fleming in 1928, Scottish man. He discovers penicillin, which is an antibiotic, very, very important. Um, if you've ever had an infection, you've probably taken some sort of penicillin. What's interesting though, is that Alexander Fleming discovered this completely by accident. <laughs> um, one day he picked up a discarded laboratory dish that he had used to grow bacteria. The dish had, some, had grown some mold, which had killed the bacteria. So he discovers this mold on accident that kills the bacteria. And it's incredibly important for the treatment of, um, of infections. What I find funny is his picture though. <laughs> Let's just zoom in on his picture. He looks very frustrated that the cameraman is there. <laughs> are, you, are you taking the picture? Go away. What, leave me be with my penicillin. All right, we also have Sigmund Freud. He helps to develop uh, something called psychoanalysis. So um, he often would like, you know, psychotherapy, that kind of thing interviewing various people about their childhoods, um, about why they're feeling depressed or why they are feeling manic or various things. Um, and he's kind of the first one to do these kind of uh, not only studies, but also this kind of therapy. Um, he looks scary. He is a bit scary. And he's, he's always with his iconic, uh, what's it called? Um, iconic cigar. Oh my God. But one thing, though, that's really important with Freud um, is that a, he came up with a lot of theories, but a lot of them were really unscientific and mostly musings of his. So a lot of his theories have actually turned out to be just not true at all. <laughs> but the important thing is that he's taking these steps towards this form of psychoanalysis. Um, one of his major theories was something called the Oedipus complex. Does anyone know the, the, the story of Oedipus? It's a Greek myth, Greek tragedy. So in Greek myth, in the Greek myth of Oedipus, Oedipus um, murders his father, unknowingly marries his mother, and then when he realizes that he has married his mother and actually had children with his own mother, he tears his own eyes out and blinds himself. Uh, really weird story. <laughs> but that's the Greeks for you. What do you expect? So he takes this story and he runs with it. And Freud comes up with this idea of the Oedipus complex or an Oedipal complex. And it's this idea that secretly, in the back of your brain, everyone secretly wants to uh, sleep with their mom or dad. And I know that's weird. It's a really weird thing to say, but that's, that's like a key theory of his, is that that's where a lot of uh, troubles come from psychologically. Um, and that's also why a lot of people, <laughs> as I was Googling Freud to, you know, construct this presentation, I found this funny thing. Oh, come on. <laughs> these were all over the internet. I, I just typed in Freud, funny. <laughs> these are the first things that are coming up. Oh, the Freud, the original your mom joke. All right, any questions? 
Yeah, Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes. Wow, good for her. One in physics and one in chemistry. She died in 1934 from leukemia caused by exposure to radiation. How sad is that? That is so very sad. So we talked about science. We talked a bit about the culture going on. Now let's talk about some literature and different arti artists. I will be 100% honest with you. I am not an artist. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you my own version of this. This will be a bit quick. Um, the generation after the war is known as the lost generation because so many young men had been not only killed, but also millions had been mutilated and wounded. There were many young men who, I mean, that, that's where they developed plastic surgery to try to reconstruct people's faces after they'd been blown apart. And, you know, some young men were unable to afford that or they were unable to get a plastic surgery. And so they had to, they wore bags over their faces to hide, hide their wounds. Um, the other thing to consider also is that, you know, there's a steep decline in population growth and also marriage rates right after the war. Because I mean, millions of young men are just gone. And so they're not getting married they're because they're gone or even the ones that are wounded, they're so grievously wounded that, or, or they're so psychologically traumatized that they can't maintain a relationship. And so this generation is known as the lost generation. And there's a, an overarching sense of cynicism, especially in the arts, in the uh, immediately following the night, or immediately following World War One. Literature explores the inner mind so there's a lot of literature that is self-reflective, that's reflective on not just, it's not just focused on plots anymore. It's not just, uh, you know, the hero goes point A, point B, point C. Instead, it's much more self-reflective and fr frankly, honestly, a little depressing. Um, there's something called the stream, stream of consciousness that becomes very popular in writing. And you guys have probably experienced stream of consciousness, probably during class, honestly. Um, that's where you kind of just let your mind wander. If you, and if you've ever noticed when you do that, your mind just kind of flits or it goes from topic to topic without really any overarching connection between them. Um, and so that's this idea of stream of consciousness. And so some writers try to reflect that feeling or that style in their own writing, in their own novels. Um, one of these famous novels is called Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Has anyone read Mrs. Dalloway? That's okay. Uh, I had to read Mrs. Dalloway in high school. Now I'll be 100% honest with you, that was the most boring book I've ever read. <laughs> it's basically about this lady going grocery shopping and getting ready for a party. And that's the entire book. <laughs> I mean, I, I can recognize it as a foundational piece of literature for the time period, especially in terms of the stream of consciousness style. But honestly, it was just a really boring book, at least in my opinion. And I just thought this was funny, the stream of consciousness. We also have the Harlem Renaissance. Um, more optimistic literary movement arose in the United States. The Harlem Renaissance was an American cultural awakening. It began in Harlem, a neighborhood in New York City that was home to many African-Americans. African-American writers and artists expressed their pride in their unique culture. Among its best known figures was the poet and playwright Langston Hughes. In his poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, Hughes reflects on the rivers associated with the African and African-American experience from the Euphrates, Congo, and Nile to the Mississippi. Novelist and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston studied African-American folklore and traditions. And so, and also can, not only with the literature, but also jazz music. 
So the Harlem Renaissance is this flowering of African American uh, cultural uh, traditions um, and innovations, and it, especially jazz becomes extremely popular in the 1920s. Um, now that being said, we should not gloss over the fact that African Americans during this time period are being very severely discriminated against. Um, and that needs to be acknowledged that, I mean, this is the height of Jim Crow, in, especially in the South. Um, but it's not I just in this. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, were African Americans allowed to go into World War I? They were. I was actually just about to talk about that. Oh, okay. uh, so after, before World War I or during World War I, I, I believe the army was not segregated. Um, so there were African American and white Americans in the same combat units. Um, after World War I, the army becomes segregated and it was segregated all the way up until world, the end of World War II. Which did is just, say again. He did. Uh-oh, that's, uh-oh. Oh, he's right? back, he's back, you're back, Jim, it's Jameson. Oh, am I back? What's yeah, he froze. he froze for a bit. Oh no, it says for... my internet connection is unstable. Okay, could you repeat what you said again? Okay, so all the way up until the end of World War II, the army was segregated, which is just crazy, honestly. I mean, so you had during World War II, there were all, all white and also Latin American combat units, but then there were all African American combat units, and there wasn't a mixing there. Um, my dad is in the army. Um, he went to. He's a warrant officer, and I, he was actually deployed uh, to Kuwait uh, about two years ago. Um, but a few years ago, he had to do. He had to go to Alabama to um, take part in a, a refresher uh, warrant officer training course, and. What's interesting about officer training <laughs> in the army is that it's basically college, but you have to do push-ups too. Uh, <laughs> so they were doing all sorts of reading and writing. He had to, <laughs> he asked for help on a research paper, which was kind of funny. Um, but he sent me this link that, because he, you know, they have reading assignments during officer training school. And he sent me this link to a report that the army had made in like 1919, so right after World War I. And this report from the army said that African Americans were not ideal soldiers because they were cowardly and lazy. Which is just, oh my God. <laughs> oh, wow. And he sent this to me, he's like, this is the most racist thing I've ever read. And I read it too. I'm like, oh my God, this is the most racist, one of the most racist things I've ever read. And it's just this, uh, maybe I can try to find it and I can link it uh, somewhere. Um, but there is this widespread discrimination, not just in the South, um, that is going on during this time period. But amongst all of that, there is this Har Harlem Renaissance, this flowering of African-American culture and identity. All right, any questions? All right, The Great Gatsby. Has anyone read that? You guys read that with Lancaster? Anyone, no takers? All right. I think we read it junior year. I saw a junior class last year reading it. Oh, really? Hmm. No, it's one of those books that is often read in high school, but I've never read it. I've never read it. <laughs> I've heard it's good, but I just, meh, I'm not very interested. I saw the movie with uh, Leo and that was fun. So I, but Great Gatsby is very much an influential book from that time period. <clears throat> so we've talked about literature, we've talked about music. Now let's talk about art, painting and murals and sculpture. So, Painters start to embrace revolutionary trends. They are moving away from uh, kind of the 
older traditions of artwork. They're moving away from uh, classical art, I guess you could say, where things have to look really super realistic. Things have to make sense. Now they're saying, no, things don't have to make sense. We can have melting clocks and we can have just figures screaming. Wonderful, a new wa wave of art. <clears throat> and so this is really kind of where abstract art starts becoming in vogue. We also have something called Dadaism. Uh, Dada was a European art movement that rejected traditional artistic values by producing work that seemed like absurd nonsense. <laughs> Dada was a revolt against civilization. Paintings and sculptures by Jean Arp. So Jean Arp made this thing down here. And Max Ernst, and Max Ernst made this, were intended to shock and disturb viewers. Some Dadaists created works made of objects they found abandoned or thrown away. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not an art guy. But it does seem like nonsense to me. <laughs> That's just my opinion. If you get something out of this, feel free. I, you know, no judgment. It's just uh, get very little out of it. Um, <clears throat> we also have surrealism, a movement that attempted to portray the workings of the unconscious mind. Surrealism rejected rational thought, which had produced the horrors of World War I, in favor of irrational or unconscious ideas. The Spanish surrealist Salvador Dali used images of melting clocks and burning giraffes, oh my God, to suggest the chaotic dream state described by Freud. Um, Salvador Dali, very, very famous surrealist painter. Um, he actually collaborated with Walt Disney, of all people, on a movie. It was like an eight minute little movie. Um, it's on Disney Plus if you, <laughs> if you want to watch it. It's only eight minutes and it's, it's weird. It's a little frightening, honestly. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. So one, one thing that's kind of funny is, especially Salvador Dali, a lot of his surrealist paintings are actually pretty cool. Um, <laughs> lots of crazy stuff going on. But I found this one picture that was really awesome looking. It had like elephants that were 15 stories tall and they had long spindly legs and they were like marching and stuff. And I wanted to put that in the in the PowerPoint. But then I realized that there's like an army of naked people. <laughs> it's just like so much nudity in the picture. So I thought to myself, oh no, this is such a cool picture, but I can't put it in the presentation. So unfortunately, uh, go look it up though. It was really cool. Uh, I think I just Googled like surrealist Salvador Dali, something like that. And it was like one of the top results. Okay, architecture. Architecture is also changing. We have a uh, Bauhaus, Bauhaus. Architecture buildings used glass, steel, and concrete, but very little ornamentation. So down here is an example of a Bauhaus uh, building. You also have architect uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and some of these are his buildings up here, some of them. Uh, Function of a building should determine its form. He used materials and forms that fit a building's environment. He believed that, quote, a building should grace its environment rather than disgrace it, unquote. And so he's, one of the things that he was very famous for was trying to get the building to kind of like merge into the environment, to kind of disappear. And especially you can see that with this, where it looks like the waterfall is like coming out of the building. It's a pretty cool. Pretty cool house. I wonder how much that costs. Henri Matisse, expressive use of color and his frequent focus on domestic subjects can be seen in The Goldfish Bowl, painted in the winter of 1921 to 20. Oh, All right, am I back? Oh yeah, you're back. You're back. Did I, do I need to repeat anything? Nope. Uh, you went on to the next slide and it froze. So you're, yeah. I wonder what this is going to look like on the video, on the recording side. All right, politics, politics, politics. So political parties are clashing in Britain, especially between the Labour and the Tory parties. But what else is new? Um, there's a huge strike in 1926 
um, it was called the general strike or the great strike where all sorts of labor unions just stopped working in a form of protest against various government policies. Um, a key huge deal is this Irish war for independence. Um, the, the Irish Republican army pictured here, or at least part of them are pictured here. They fought this long running guerrilla war against the British um, or against the English it, to try to get Ireland to become an independent nation. Um, they were led by a guy named Michael Collins. There's actually a really good movie about this called Michael Collins, and it's starring Liam Neeson of Taken and Qui-Gon Jinn fame. Um, so they fight this long, grueling guerrilla war against, against the British, and eventually they win. And they get their independence, but the only thing, though, is that the Southern Ireland is mostly Catholic, and Northern Ireland is mostly Protestant. And the Protestants were largely loyal to the United Kingdom, to the British. And so part of the deal for Irish independence was that Northern Ireland is still part of the United Kingdom, whereas Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, is its own independent country. And that caused a lot of consternation. Um, there was a Irish civil war immediately after the independence was gained. People were angry. Like, <laughs> why did you just give away Northern Ireland? That's Ireland. That should be part of us. And that consternation lasted arguably up until the 90s. Uh, the new Irish Republican army in like the 80s and the 90s, they set off car bombs and stuff like that. Uh, terrorism to try to get Northern Ireland to be part of the Republic of Ireland. Um, there's actually a really, <laughs> there's a really funny show on Netflix called The Dairy Girls. That's all about this. It's it's Northern Ireland in the 90s, and honestly, it's one of the funniest shows I've ever watched. <laughs> I cried laughing during several scenes. It was so funny. So I highly recommend the Dairy Girls, um, but it's definitely TVMA, um, but so funny. All right, there's also peacetime troubles in France. Um, lots of conflict about where do we go from here? There's political parties vying for one another or vying against one another for power. Um, there's also a lot of concerns about the spread of communism with the, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. There's worries that it'll spread to else, other places. And of course, that also leads into post-war fears in the United States, um, what is called uh, so-called the Red Scare, um, where there's this kind of a, almost a paranoia around communism spreading and there's gonna be a communist revolution in the United States. And very often people chalk that up to being in an irrational fear. Uh, but one thing I think we ought to think about though is the time period when they are living in. Is the Bolsheviks, they're taking over and they are killing anyone that opposes them. The Bolsheviks were an extreme totalitarian group. Um, so I, I don't think it's entirely fair to say that the Red Scare was merely paranoia. Now, that being said, there were things like the Palmer Raids, where the United States government, the FBI, uh, were doing raids against suspected communists and suspected socialists and labor unions, arresting people uh, for their political beliefs and throwing them in prison. Um, there was also a lot of uh, you know, outing people like, oh, so-and-so is a communist and they get fired from their job, uh, blacklisting, but that's arguably a bit more in the 50s. Um, the point being though, is that I think it's important to see both sides. I guess that's largely what I'm trying to get at. Uh, major outcomes of the Paris Peace Conference were five peace treaties ending World War I, including the Treaty of Versailles and the creation of the League of Nations. 
So there's also a very difficult international situation. What do we do? Uh, France very much wanted to enforce the Treaty of Versailles fully and as quickly as possible. They wanted to twist the knife in Germany as, as much as they could. I mean, to be fair to them, most of the Western Front was fought on French territory and the French lost a lot of people. And so there is a little bit of a sense of revenge on the part of the French. Um, the Americans and the British were a bit more moderate. They're saying, yeah, yeah, we can punish Germany, but we don't have to kick them so hard while they're down. And meanwhile, France is like, no, let's just keep kicking them forever. Um, the other part of this is that France is worried about another German invasion. I mean, why wouldn't you be? So they build what is called the Maginot Line. You can see the Maginot Line here, right along the border with Germany, just in case the Germans invade again which eventually the Germans do, I guess. <laughs> so in World War I, Germany went through Belgium to avoid French defenses. Anyone want to guess what they do in World War II? Anyone? Come on, talk to me. Don't they just go directly into France? Well, they go through Belgium again. They do the exact same thing, which is hilarious to me. <laughs> I Meanwhile, well, the French are building this line over here and the Germans just go around it. Like, it's not gonna do. why didn't we think of that? <laughs> and so they spent millions of dollars building these forts and Barbara Tuckman described them as castles sunk into the earth. This is kind of what they looked like. Um, just huge forts and uh, with railroad lines that connected all of them. There's like hospitals inside them. There's barracks, there's food storage. There's a water supply. I mean, these are it, hugely expensive fortifications in order to stop the Germans. And the Germans just go around them, which is horribly ironic. Um, there's also something called the Kellogg-Briand Pact which is passed in 1928 or signed in 1928. Basically a bunch of countries got together and they decided from here on out, from, from now on, war is illegal. And if you go to war, you'll go to jail. How did that go? Not great, I'm guessing. No, I mean, what happened? Did they end war? Is war now illegal? No. No, it did nothing. It's all just fluff, it's all paper. And of course you have the League of Nations, which is designed to try to prevent wars to, in order to negotiate peace, which was also a horrible failure because they had no power to do anything. All they could do is say, you're bad. Hey, Italy, don't invade Ethiopia, that's bad. Hey, Germany, don't invade Czechoslovakia, that's bad. Another horrible failure. And this is another cross section of the Mar Maginot line. You can just see how many things are, are in these forts. And of course, uh, the war had a huge effect on the economy, blew out the budgets of all the major countries. Um, lots of scarce natural resources funneled into making <laughs> things that explode. Um, and so after the war though, there is Britain and France and Germany, they're all trying to recover. And also on top of that, millions of young men who normally would be in the workforce are gone. So they're trying to recover from that. For the Americans though, it's a boom. Roaring 20s, the economy's doing great. It's gonna go up forever and ever and ever. Is it going to go up forever and ever and ever? No. No, no. what happens? World War II. Well that, but before World War II, what happens to the economy? 
the Great Depression. Thank you. The Great Depression hits. So Black Thursday, 1929, October 24th, the stock market crashes and burns. And with it, confidence in the stock market and investment crashes too. Banks start toppling like dominoes, all uh, one by one by one. Millions of people start losing their money. Um, I've, I'm not gonna go into too much detail of this because I actually have three different videos that are all about this topic. I can put, I can put links to them um, on the Google Classroom, but I've got, I've got three different videos that try to explain why this happened. Point being though, is that millions of people lose their money, millions of people lose their jobs, and it's a depression that spreads all over the world. It affects almost every single country. I think the only country that wasn't really affected by it was the Soviet Union, and that's mainly because they were communist and they didn't have market economies anyway, and they weren't really doing trade internet. Well, they were trying to avoid international trade as much as possible. Um, I mean, in the United States, it was devastating. One in four people did not have a job. 25% of the working population, sorry, 25% of the adult population did not have a job. And think about that. Think about how awful that would be. And these are just some stats showing bank failures. In 1933, there were 5,000 bank failures. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> oh my word. So all the countries, they're desperately trying to find solutions to this problem. People are destitute, people are looking for handouts, people are lining up outside soup kitchens. Um, and one of, the, one of the solutions is proposed by John Maynard Keynes is you boost government spending. And so this can definitely be seen with FDR's New Deal programs, these economic programs to try to help lift the United States out of the depression. Things like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the National Industrial Recovery Act, um, the Tennessee Valley Authority, all sorts of especially work programs to try to help people get out of the depression. Give them a job so that way they have some money to spend. Um, and overall, especially with the depression, there's a loss of faith in democracy. There's a feeling, especially, there's, a, there's, there's this feeling going around, especially on the extreme fringes of politics, that democracy has failed. And you can see this with the communists, for instance, and also with the fascists. The fascists were very much opposed to parliamentary democracy. Mussolini said the struggle between the two worlds, fascism and democracy can permit no compromises. It's either us or them. And there's this feeling that liberalism, that free markets, that democracy has failed because, partly because of the chaos of the depression but also partly because, especially for the fascists in Italy and Germany, they feel like they've been betrayed or left out, left out in the cold by the Treaty of Versailles. We'll talk more about the fascists in 17.6, which is on Wednesday. Um, and that's that. Any questions? All right, I'm going to stop recording then because we have gotten what we